George, it's a great honor having you on my show. Finally, I'm a big fan of yours, of your YouTube videos. Um, I'm following you on Twitter. So it's great having you. Thank you for your time already. Well, thank you for having me on your show. It's a pleasure. <laughs> thank you very much. So um, I have so many questions, actually, but we have to um, come to some points. Um, so uh, you've traveling through the world for, for the past decade. Um, you have been living in the US, in South America, in the Caribbean, in Puerto Rico. So where are you right now, actually? Where do we meet you? Well, right now I'm in Florida. Oh, uh, I was nice. supposed no to be in, Yeah, I was supposed to be in Puerto Rico. And uh, I was there for a little over 24 hours and I just couldn't stand the, the restrictions that they had put on their population and yeah. how draconian they are. And at the end of the day, regardless of the number that you have in your bank statement or the, uh, the wealth you have in your portfolio, if you don't have personal freedom and if the government is locking you in your house like they are in Puerto Rico at 10 o'clock at night, not allowing you to leave until seven o'clock in the morning or whatever it is, and you don't have access to really any, any services, you can't really go to a restaurant, you can't go to a theater, you can't go to a nightclub, to a cafe, then what's the point of having money in the first place? So exactly. when you get to a situation like that, you realize that the number one priority is personal freedom and liberty. Yeah. And so I was in Puerto Rico, like I said, a little over 24 hours. And I left as soon as I could, took the next flight out. And uh, so I came to Florida, where I am now. There, there are parts of Florida that are still a little over the top with the measures, but in the restrictions. But where I am on the west coast of Florida, near Naples, it's, I mean, it's like 2019. So it's, it's fantastic to go to the gym and uh, not have anyone yelling at you for wearing a mask or, you know, you can wear one if you want, but uh, you don't have to wear one going to grocery stores to Walmart target. And it's very uh, pleasant to be in that type of environment once again. So that's why I'm in Florida. I definitely, definitely agree. I can imagine because, um, yeah, you, you live in the paradise right now, actually, because in Germany, we have the hard lockdown already since November 2020, and they have no solution. It's just ever ongoing, and it's, it's horrible. It's like a prison. So what do you think? Are we heading for socialism? Well, I think we're on the road to serfdom. Uh, one of the things that, you know, Puerto Rico really impacted me. Uh, quite heavily, uh, what they're doing there. I mean, they have police officers on every corner that are writing people tickets for uh, not wearing a mask over their nose. As an example. When they're outside by themselves walking their dog, and it sounds like in, in a lot of areas in the world right now, unfortunately, it's even more uh, over the top and more draconian. It's a police state, really. So uh, one of the things that I did is I went back and reread and listened to uh, The Road to Serfdom by Hayek. Ah, uh, yeah. to try to get some sort of grasp as to what is happening right now in the world and what we could see in the future. There's, there are no certainties, there are only probabilities. But I think by going back and studying history and reading books uh, you know, from the greats like that, because they were dealing with the exact same struggles. Uh, obviously, there were no lockdowns in the, uh, in the 40s, 50s or something like that. But uh, it was still a push. There was a huge push towards socialism and central planning after World War II in the United States. And Hayek actually wrote that book as a counter narrative. And uh, you see the same types of uh, ideas, let's say, just repeating over and over and over again. And it's, um, you know, we think that right now we're living in unprecedented times. Uh, to a certain degree, we are. But uh, in, in other ways, we're not. And it's just history repeating itself and kind of exactly. rhyming. So from my standpoint, it was comforting to go back and just listen to that over and over and over again uh, to try to get some bearings on where we are now. But the point is that, yes, uh, the United States and the developed world is definitely on the road to serfdom. Now, in his book, and I've got the, uh, an audio book where he uh, has some... Um, some notes and some thoughts after the book was written where he kind of gives you an editorial and uh what he said is there's two you know the definition of socialism is really the government controlling the means of production but it, a lot of people conflate that with a welfare state 
such as Sweden or yeah. Denmark, something like that. And the two are not uh, really the same. But Hayek said that regardless of whether you want to call it socialism or welfareism, although they are different, they're both putting you on that road to serfdom. It's just a matter of timing. Uh, if the government owns the means of production, you're going to get to totalitarianism a lot faster than you would if you've got this big welfare state, but they both go to the same place. So it's up to the population to educate themselves and realize, be cognizant uh, of what's going on around them so they can get off that path and move over in a direction that is going to be much more sustainable long-term and it's gonna be beneficial for society at large, not only economically, but from a standpoint of, of liberty and freedom. Yeah, um, extraordinary times. We, we, I think we're, we're witnessing a history right now in the making. So learnings from, 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 from this time, um, what to watch out when to pick a country? Because many people ask me as well, where to emigrate? Where, where can we have freedom? That's an incredibly difficult question. I mean, you look at someone like me that has a, a significant amount of financial resources, so I'm not constrained by that. I don't have a wife. I don't have any kids. So I could quite literally go anywhere on the planet Earth I wanted right now. And uh, I, trust me, I've done the research. <laughs> and there are no, I ask few, you. <laughs> there are very few places that are open. You got Tanzania is an option. And I was thinking about going to Tanzania. And I'm actually interested in Tanzania from an investment standpoint long term as well. So okay. kind of you, you kill two birds with one stone. But it was a, a 30 hour flight. And I've got a, a rebel capitalist live event in Miami, June 11th to the 13th, which is a, an investment conference I'm doing. And so I didn't want to go all the way out to Tanzania, then have to come all the way back for that event in June. So the, the, the happy uh, medium for me, you know, the compromise was to come to Florida, where, uh, like I said earlier, in, in Naples, it's, uh, it's just wide open. It's, it's very pleasant. There are very few restrictions. Uh, you know, some businesses uh, request that you wear a mask, but they give you the option. Uh, even the big chain stores, which I thought was fascinating. You know, you'd think that like a Target or a Walmart that had a national footprint uh, would, would be more, um, would enforce those restrictions more. But even if you go to a Target there, nobody is wearing a mask. Very few employees are. And so um, it's not as good maybe as Tanzania where uh, it's just it's basically 2019 there, but it's still uh, a great place to be. So if you're in the United States, I think you got to look at places like Idaho. I was in yeah. Sandpoint, Idaho. It's what it's 2019 there for sure. Uh, I was even in restaurants where the waitresses and the cooks weren't wearing masks. Uh, the, you know, what was funny when I was there visiting family, uh, some of my family members in Sandpoint haven't been outside of Idaho since March of 2020. Incredible. And I was telling them how it, it, you know, it was in the airports and on the yeah. planes and all, about all these restrictions and people wearing masks when they're uh, walking their dog, when no one's within a mile radius, when they're in their car by themselves or, yeah. uh, you know, it, it, or that you even have to wear a mask going into a grocery store. You know, they didn't believe me. <laughs> they yeah, I'm, I'm not joking. Up. They, they, did, they yeah. did not believe me. They said, no, no, you've got to be exaggerating. There's no way uh, Americans would go for that. We just, we just don't believe you. And I'm like, you know, I told I said, turn on the TV. I mean, you guys have been watching. Oh, we don't pay attention to that nonsense. So you see, that's uh, the type of attitude that you have in Idaho. So if you're someone who really loves liberty and freedom, that's definitely a place to go along with the West coast of Florida. Miami's not very good, yeah. uh, but then outside of those States, when you go into other countries, other than Tanzania, maybe Belarus, I've heard is good. Uh, Sweden yeah. might yeah. be decent. Um, but I, I don't know of uh, any others. Yeah. So what do you think, which will be the best country during the next economic crisis? Will it be as well Tanzania or Sweden or Florida, or you think about another country? 
Well, I think you've got to look at, I mean, longer term, you know, once yep. this is behind us, I think you've got to look at countries who won't benefit in any way, shape or form. The politicians would not even benefit yep. from the Great Reset Agenda. And so what that boils down to is a lot of the climate change initiatives yeah. um, that are you know, being pushed. And, and I'm not saying they're, saying they're right or wrong. That's for another video. But they're being pushed by uh, the World Economic Forum. And so if you look at countries like Brazil, if you look at the Middle East, yeah. if you look at Russia, um, they are going to be, they would be impacted negatively yeah. uh, to a great degree if these uh you know if this agenda is pushed through by these global elite and so the, the most likely you're going to get some extreme pushback there also if you look at the what the great reset is trying to do it's all about central planning and it's all about socialism yeah. or potentially even communism and if you look at the countries in uh eastern europe that have just you know a lot of the older folks in the country remember what it was like to live under socialism you know, such as uh, you know, the old Czech Republic or old yeah. Yugoslavia or something like that. Uh, you know, those people, they, they've seen this movie before and they know how it ends. Yeah. And so I think it would be much more difficult for them to go along with the, the plans of the World Economic Forum if they're moving more towards a centrally planned economy or socialism. It would be much harder to convince those people to go for it than, unfortunately, uh, some individuals in the developed countries like the United States, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, who haven't experienced those types exactly. of yeah. uh, tragedies, economic or, or from a personal or societal standpoint in their lives. Yeah, I, I think um, people in the West um, tend to, to left wing policies. They, they like the universal basic income. They like the socialistic ideas, MMT and so on. But the people in the, in the Eastern part of Europe, for example, they can, remember, they can remember how it was during socialism and communism. And they always warning me like, hey, it's the same old pattern. You know, it's like in, in, in the 80s, in the last century. So guys, don't fall for it. But we all do because it's so sweet and yummy and everybody pays Case, but we know socialism never worked and planned economies either so it's 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 incredible it's crazy and it, it drives me crazy in germany i i can tell you we'll have big elections in september and i think the green party will win this election so we will have a green chancellor can you imagine after angela merkel we will have a green chancellor she's 40 years old and she's she never worked in her life yeah she always was a politician and she will screw it up totally i'm so sure so that's why i come to Naples, so hey, keep a seat free for me and let's order some beer because yeah. this will happen. actually, yeah. I'm in Cape Coral right now, which is very close to Naples. There's actually a lot of Germans here, yeah. I mean, you see, a lot, yeah. yeah. In fact, the, the place where I'm staying right now, this house is a gorgeous place right on the canal. Uh, it, it's owned by a German, it's and me, the property, by the way. <laughs> this is you own this place, <laughs> it's very nice. Congratulations on the remodel, it's fantastic. Thanks, thanks. my father uh, did it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but the, the gal that manages the property is German as well. Okay. And uh, I, you know, there are a lot of Germans in Ecuador as well. When yeah, I, I, I used to, when I first went to South America, that's where I first started to invest. And a lot of the hostels were owned by uh, German. Germans and Austrians. And all the Ecuadorians knew that if they wanted to go someplace that was clean, where you could get a good room, you always go to a place that was owned by a German. Exactly. So, yeah, let's take a step back for a moment. Who is George Gammon actually? Because it's the first time you're on a German um, channel. I'm really grateful about that, that you appear on a German channel the first time with me. And you produce, from my view, some of the best deep, reviews um, in, in macroeconomics, um, economics at all on YouTube. It, it's, it's a pleasure watching you and I have to recommend everybody here on this channel in my audience, my subscribers, check out the channel from George. It's amazing. It's, it's a blast. It's much better than my channel. So <laughs> it's, uh, I will go, I will come there one day, but you are definitely uh, an idol. So um, I will put all the, the links in, in the show notes, of course. So um, who are you and what did you do before actually? Yeah, well, I almost flunked out of high school. And I always like to tell that story because people might watch uh, my videos or some of the interviews or something like that yeah. and assume 
that they need to have a extensive education to understand this stuff and you don't uh you know i'm just completely self-taught so if i can get it any of your viewers can or anyone uh listening to this can understand these concepts most of the things that confuse people is just the, the language you know they use this esoteric lingo and once you understand the language it's pretty straightforward but uh after uh, well the first venture was always with business and entrepreneurship back in the late 90s i started a t-shirt company that uh i wouldn't call it a company i tried to start a t-shirt little business that failed miserably but i was always an entrepreneur and uh had some some wins i had some losses uh fortunately i i did a little bit uh i had a few more of the winners than i had the losers and i was able to retire at the age of 38 in 2012 Congratulations. But I was always very good at, at making money from a standpoint of business, but I knew nothing about investing. Absolutely zero. I didn't know what a yield curve was. I really didn't know what the Federal Reserve was. Didn't know what the bond market. I mean, I had no clue. Okay. And But I had a, a, a significant amount of savings uh, when I retired, but it wasn't enough to where I could maintain my standard of living and not have to get a return on my money. I needed about a five or 6% return okay. in order to maintain my standard of living so I wouldn't have to draw down my savings. And just being the type of person I am, I didn't want to delegate that to a financial planner or an advisor. And I, I just like controlling that stuff. You can imagine as an entrepreneur, you know, you're always in that position. So I was actually in Singapore about 10 minutes before a dinner date and I was on YouTube and I stumbled across a series from Milton Friedman called Free to Choose. Yeah. And uh, it was just, I mean, it's like I got hit in the, the head with a ton of bricks. I mean, it was just the most incredible thing I had ever seen because he articulated what had been in my mind and, and the experiences that I have had and what I thought to be true, not only as an entrepreneur but or an employer, but also as an employee. I mean, it just, it just, it really resonated and he just articulated it beautifully. So that took me down the rabbit hole. I started studying him, Thomas Sowell as well. And then I moved on to investors that have that similar mindset, such as Jim Rogers, Peter Schiff, uh, Rick Rule, Doug Casey. And uh, I decided, okay, this is the type of investing I want to do. I really, uh, see eye to eye. And this makes a lot of sense to me. So especially Jim Rogers, yeah, because at the time I had made quite a bit of money overseas. So I wasn't really, I didn't have that, that fear that most people have or of the unknown and trying to make money in South America, as an example. Yeah. And, you know, Jim Rogers made a lot of those investments. So I figured I want to do what Jim Rogers does and just buy things when they're cheap and sell them when they're expensive. So I looked around me in the United States in 2012 and real estate was pretty darn cheap. So I started investing heavily in real estate. I figured that game out. And then I said, well, maybe I can increase my returns by going down to South America. So I started investing in real estate in Colombia in 2015. Now that was more of a macro play in the sense that I wanted to go long oil. Because yeah. if you remember back to 2015, that time, oil got under $30 a barrel. Mm -hmm. And I was smart enough to know what I don't know. And uh, I didn't know oil. <laughs> so I'm like, okay, well, I want to go long oil, but I don't know anything about it. But I do know that the Colombian peso is loosely tied to oil because mm -hmm. the majority of their exports are, are oil. And um, so I thought, okay, well, the Colombian peso is loosely tied to oil correlated if oil goes up maybe the peso does too against the dollar uh, so let me buy an asset that's denominated in pesos because then by default i'm kind of going long oil well the only asset class that i understood was real estate so that's why i started buying real estate in columbia it was actually a play on oil so we were there and i i kind of built a team which i still have today where we do, a, we buy a lot of distressed properties from motivated sellers and we remodel them and we either sell them or keep them okay. in a rental portfolio. And uh, in 2019, we were doing a lot of these projects and I thought to myself, well, shoot, this would make a good TV show because they're very popular in the US, so why wouldn't they be popular down here? 
So I, you know, it's a great example of the entrepreneurial mindset where you just kind of shoot first and ask questions later. <laughs> and as an entrepreneur, a lot of times uh, you have an, probably an unjustified confidence in your own ability. <laughs> and so I had never done a TV show. I didn't know the first thing about it, but I'm like, yeah, let's just go meet with the local station TV network and pitch it. So I went down there, long story short, I don't know how, but, but they bought into my vision. And so I produced a TV show there called Vita and Remodelacion. And so the remodeling life, and it followed me as the, as the real estate investor and my designer and architect, they're a husband and wife team. And uh, it followed us around, we did 13 episodes. It was a big success, everyone loved it. But after the first season, and I had to produce it myself, so I had to hire all the editors yeah. and the camera people. So after the first season, we took a little bit of break, but I didn't want to lay off any of my camera people or my editors. So I said, well, I'll start a YouTube channel. And uh, initially we were talking about real estate, but my real passion is macroeconomics, as, as you can tell. Yeah. And uh, so I kind of inserted a few of the macro videos, those topics, but I didn't think anyone would ever want to listen to a video on the repo market or quantitative easing or something like that. So ironically enough, the real estate videos didn't do that well. <laughs> no one really watched them. They're getting like, you know, maybe 50 views or something. Uh, but the economic videos would do decent. You know, they'd get 200, 300 views which for me back then, that was a, that was a big deal. That was huge. And uh, then we just stuck with it and the channel completely exploded. And uh, we had 100,000 subscribers, I think in maybe eight or nine months. And now we have uh, uh, 300,000. I started another channel and a podcast. I'm one of them. <laughs> Thank yeah, you. I, I know. See, I, I think the first video I watched from you was like when you had like 40 or 50,000 subscribers. And I was just baffed about how you translated all this complexity in, in, in easy words for everybody. I just thought he's, an, he, he's like a magician. Yeah, it's perfect. And then you always say like, yeah, I ex explain it in three simple steps. And they're really simple, guys. Check it out on his YouTube channel. It's really, really, really good made stuff, high quality and easy to understand for everybody. But even if you're not into the macro uh, business or in, 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 in macroeconomics, you will understand that repo, definitely a great video to watch. And yeah, that's really, it's, it's like a gift you have, I think, because it's, it's so easy. It sounds so easy when you explain it and then with your, with, your, with your board, it's perfect. It's just perfect. I will copy it one day. Just wait. I will be the German George Gammon. <laughs> oh, you know, feel free to use those. No, right just kidding. Videos, but, uh... <laughs> I need but, to give most of the credit to the editors. They're yeah. the ones that I think uh, Great job. Are, are, are the ones that uh, create that type of experience for the viewer where it's easy to digest information. But, you know, the, although we talk about some esoteric things such as repo or quantitative easing, the banking system, how money is created, the dollar. Yeah. Uh, in today's environment, People need to understand that even the average Joe and Jane, whether you're in Germany, whether you're in the United States, doesn't matter where you are in the world, especially in the developed economies, you have to understand this stuff. You need to understand how negative rates uh, work. You need to understand how the bond market works, central banking. You need to understand the overall vision that the global elites have for the global economy, yeah. because if you don't, you're you're going to wake up one day and you're going to say what on earth just happened yep. to my liberty and my portfolio exactly. and possibly my purchasing power mm -hmm. i always say you can either be prepared or you're going to be a victim yep. and uh in, in the world we live in today unfortunately because it's an inflationary world. You know, back in the late 1800s, and I, I don't know what it was like in Germany, but in the United States, uh, from the year 1800 to 1900, consumer prices went down by 50%. Yeah, yeah. yeah. 50. So, and, and, and especially during the late 1800s, you had maybe 2% deflation year. per year, so prices going down, but nominal wages per capita income actually went up by about 1% per year. So did nominal GDP on a per capita basis. So wages basically went up, but prices 
went down. And you could get about a 4% interest rate Mm. in the bank. So if you look at a real yield, that's maybe a 6 or 7% return you could get on your money as far as purchasing power just by placing it in a bank. Mm. You see, So think about what that would do to the average Joe and Jane. They would be uh, they would be incentivized to save and just park, put their money in the bank. They wouldn't be incentivized to speculate on stocks or real estate yeah. or use leverage, you know, you know and, and they would, they, and they wouldn't have to know all of these issues going on with central banks and stimulus and money printing, and they wouldn't need to be a professional speculator or, or gambler. But unfortunately now, since the Fed will just come right out and explicitly say that their inflation target is 2% plus per annum. So what that means is they want the stuff that you buy at the grocery store to go up by at least 2% per year. They want you to be 2% poorer per year. And somehow they think that that is going to drive the economy forward. It's complete nonsense. But my main point is unfortunately nowadays, uh, because of this inflationary environment in a fiat money system, uh, we have to be professional speculators or investors, hopefully, uh, where back in the 1800s, if we had sound money and we had the government and the central banks out of the equation and we just went back to like a free banking system, then we wouldn't have a need for any of this stuff. And we could just focus on enjoying our lives and producing goods and services and being more productive, which at the end of the day, is how true wealth of a society is measured. Yeah, yeah, very nice explained. Definitely right. I agree with you 100%. That's why my channel is called Financial Intelligence. That's what Mm. I want to give the people because they have to understand how money works, how is it created, what's the job of a central bank. And if you understand how this works, then you can, yeah, um, defense yourself. You know, you can um, buy the right investment to protect your purchasing power for the future because I see big inflation coming. And that's what my intention is to help the people around me. So um, they will not lose everything like they did in the last couple of hundred years, couple of times in Germany, we had um, the um, monetary uh, reset in in 48, for example, people lost 90% in average, you know, and we had in 1923 Weimar Republic, this was, uh, people still feel it, you know, they they still know the stories from their ancestors, from their grand grandparents, people lost everything. And I think we're on the track to hyperinflation right now, because they print like never before, and the central banks are in the end game. This is my opinion, because this fiat money um, system is dying, and they know it, and that's why they want to put central uh, digital central cu- currencies uh, on the table so we have to pay in in digital euro digital dollar in the future so um what's your take on this actually on cbdc's central bank digital currencies you think this is part of the great reset from klaus schwab or what do you think about this what's your take about that yeah i absolutely do but b- before we get there yeah. i think you you touched on a, a very interesting point going back to the hyperinflation of I believe it was uh, 23, wasn't yeah. it? 23. 23. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I went back and, and studied that quite extensively. Okay. And what was fascinating to me is the, uh, and what the currency was, was the, the mark? Reichsmark, yes, yes. Okay, yeah. so the, the currency between 19, it was a, a brief time frame of around two years, a year and a half, maybe. So from call it 20 to 21 and a half, or maybe from, from 21 to 22 and a half, I guess, because it was right before the hyperinflation. Yep. The currency in Germany actually went up against the dollar. It appreciated against the dollar. And then all of a sudden, because of what had ha- what started happening, back in 1914. That's another thing most people don't realize. The, the, the seeds of the hyperinflation were planted back in 1914, where they were printing money uh, for the war. You know, that's always what happens. These governments today is print loads of money to go to war. And what ended up happening is they kind of have this crack up boom, but they were inflating the money supply by 50, 60% per year. But what was happening, are the assets were going up at a faster rate then the value of the currency was was depreciating 
against goods and services. Yep. So they thought that this was just some sort of economic miracle that they could just keep doing this. And this crack up boom, people were getting richer because again, the asset prices are going up faster than the currency was going down. And uh, then what? another thing I thought was fascinating, taking us to the central bank digital currency, okay. is uh, in, in, I believe it was 1920, the United States had done a similar thing with the growth of M2 money supply, but they decided to kind of turn off the spigot. And I believe the UK might've been in the same boat. Uh, but then Germany, just instead of turning off the spigot, they turned it on uh, to an even greater degree. But what was fascinating, based on what I read, is during that time frame from 1920 to about 1922, the commercial banks got really confident with the, the German economy, and they started lending a lot more. And uh, so they took part of this boom. And I think why that's important is because if people understand the creation of money, mm -hmm. they realize that money typically, typically is created by the commercial banking system yeah. in the sense that when they issue a new loan, that's brand new money that has been created that did not exist before. Yeah. So your broad money supply increased by, let's say, $100,000 if a bank creates a loan for $100,000 for someone to buy a house, as an example. Yeah. So a lot of incredibly smart people that I talk to, such as Jeff Snyder and Brent Johnson, believe that it's going to be very difficult to get uh, sustained inflation like we saw maybe in the United States in the 1970s or moving into a hyperinflation period if you don't have those commercial banks creating all of these loans and doing it very aggressively. And my point was, I, I thought that was fascinating that that was actually a key component of that transition period going into the hyperinflation event of 1923 in Germany. So where does that, let's take that uh, knowledge and uh, that kind of history lesson and apply it to what we see today. Well, you've got, circuit, you've got examples like Japan where they've been trying to create inflation for call it decades and they haven't been able to do it. Uh, so you say, okay, well, why, what's happening? And then you have to understand the difference between bank reserves at a central bank and then the actual broad money supply. So uh, I look at it as the financial economy and the real economy. Yeah. And you can create more, quote unquote, money in the financial economy. And if it's a liability of the central bank, meaning it's these bank reserves, it doesn't necessarily filter out into the real economy. And, this, and uh, using the United States as an example, it doesn't necessarily create more dollars that are in the real economy chasing the same amount of goods and services, therefore creating that, uh, that price inflation. You see a lot of asset inflation, which is definitely something uh, that we've seen here. So what has to happen is you've got to, well, if you're a central banker, especially the Fed, you're trying, you see what happened in Japan, that they were very unsuccessful. You actually see what happened in Europe over the last uh, couple of decades or so. You see, okay, they were kind of, uh, they're unsuccessful in creating this inflation. So how do we do it, right? Yeah. Well, you've got to convince the commercial banks to go ahead and create more money. Well, what if you can't do that? What if that's not working? Well, the next option you would have is to try to get the government to spend a lot more money. And then you, the central bank, the Fed, would go ahead and monetize it. Because you see, if the, if the uh, government issues bonds to spend money, all they're doing is taking money out of the economy and then just putting it right back in. There's really no net increase in currency units. But what happens is if they sell bonds and the Fed buys those bonds by just creating more bank reserves, then when the treasury spends that money into the real economy, that's actually creating additional money supply, which is one of the reasons you see M2, which is our, our broad money yeah. measure in the United States, just go completely parabolic yeah. in 2020. I mean, the M2 money supply went up by like 20 or 25%. Yeah. The problem with that is, yes, 
if that's sustained, it most likely will create the type of inflation needed to bail out these over leveraged uh, governments. But you're dependent upon the politicians agreeing and getting these stimulus package continuously through and that money out. So you're like, okay, maybe it'll happen, maybe it won't. And that's why whenever you hear Jerome Powell talk about fiscal policy, or excuse me, monetary policy, he always says that, well, we're, we're doing pretty much everything we can do. We're kind of, he won't come out and say it, but he's like, we're pushing on a rope right now. We need fiscal, 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 fiscal. That's why they always talk about it because right now, that's the only way to create more currency units to create that inflation they need because the commercial banks aren't playing the game. Yeah. Their lending has decreased dramatically into the real economy. Therefore, they're creating a lot fewer dollars than they were in the past and definitely a lot fewer than the government needs to create this sustained type of inflation like the 1970s, which would bring the debt to GDP down to a much more manageable level. Okay, so that's option number two, rely on the politicians. Probably not a good bet there. So option number three is to get around the commercial banking system. So how do you do that? Here we go. Central bank digital currency. Exactly. So if we all have a, a, an account with the central bank, whether it's the ECB or the Fed in our case, and every entity, every business, every person has an account with the Fed, then the lending or creating more dollars can occur from the Fed to the individual or the entity in the real economy. They don't have to go, the, the commercial banking system is not involved at all. And you see the commercial banking system, they are incentivized by profit. You know, if they make a loan, they wanna get paid back. Because if they don't get paid back, then they could have negative equity, they could be insolvent, they could go bust. But what happens if the Federal Reserve isn't paid back? Nothing, yeah. nothing. They, they don't really have a P&L. They don't have to worry about that. So they can just go ahead and issue loans to, I mean, if you think the lending was, was crazy back in, in the United States, the housing market, in 2005 and 2006, you know, we have that saying that anyone could get a million dollar home loan if they could fog a mirror. If you think that was crazy, just wait till you see what happens All right. when you get a central bank digital currency. They're going to be issuing loans to anyone uh, that will take them to get that money supply up. And another thing, now moving on to the topic of personal freedom and liberty, is they don't necessarily have to issue loans based on your ability to pay it back. And this is where I think, and again, I, I wanna make sure I'm clear, we're talking about probabilities. We're not talking about certainties. This may or may not happen. I just think that the probabilities are a little higher, especially over the next five years, that this is what we see play out. Because if you think about it, there's really no alternative yeah. for the governments and the central banks. So I think the motivation is going to be high there, especially with the MMT narrative that you're seeing becoming very popular with society at large and the stimulus checks. You know, I think that's kind of the, the direction we're going. So anyway, going back to the, the, the point there is they create this central bank digital currency. It gets around the system. They don't have to lend you money based on your ability to pay it back. So they could lend you money based on your social score, as an example. Okay. Uh, they could also lend money just to specific groups that were favored by the, the government at the time. You know, so if there's some group that has, uh, for whatever reason, let's, let's say, uh, you know, women make 75 cents on the dollar. You know, that's that narrative that you always hear in the United States, which yeah. is complete nonsense, you know, if you really look below surface level. It's just different choices and whatnot. But, uh, but this is this political narrative. So what you, could, what you could conceivably see in the future is the central bank would issue a lower interest rate to women than they would to men. And uh, you could, and it would, you know, whether it's car loans, business loans, home loans, uh, everything that you do as far as borrowing money would have to go through Jerome Powell and some sort of committee 
or they approve it or they don't approve it. So you see the direction we go here is instead of having a meritocracy when it comes to uh, lending, now all of a sudden it's just political poll and who you know, and if you just happen to be included in that group that is currently favored by the government, uh, then you're going to get what you need, but everyone else is probably going to, to suffer. And they're going to try to micromanage the economy to create this their vision of utopia. But we know how that story ends. We saw that in Russia, uh, you know, communist Russia. We saw it in China. We understand what happens when the government tries to micromanage things. Mm, that never works. So, but this would lead actually to rising prices on the house markets if the central banks would give money to everybody and everybody would buy a house because every um, everyone wants a house. You know, it's like um, yeah, having his own castle is the, the, the biggest goal to achieve. So this would lead to even more expensive house prices, wouldn't it? So what's your take on this? Because you are an investor. You, you know real estate better than everybody else. So what's your take on this? Aren't the prices are all already overpriced the house prices uh, oh, yeah. is it in a bubble uh, yeah. and uh, yeah yeah so but this would mean we see a melt up a crack up boom actually yeah okay yeah, that's right yeah yeah uh, a crack up boom i think is is what you're seeing right now in the united states for sure okay and i believe that was a, a term mises uh used correct me if i'm wrong but uh yeah that's exactly what i think is going on but I think when you're looking at real estate, what you have to ask yourself is, are prices going up in nominal terms yeah. or in real terms? Because mm. you know, just because your house goes up by 5% per year doesn't mean that you're increasing your purchasing power. If inflation is going up by 10% per year, then you're actually losing purchasing power. Yeah. So I think that's the, the first thing that you've got to think through. Also, A lot of people focus on the demand side of the equation. So if the central bank is just giving money to everyone, they're sending out UBI stimulus checks, they're giving home loans to anyone that can sign their name on the dotted line. We think about this increasing demand, but what we don't usually think about is the supply side of the equation. And I think that the what we're talking about as far as the central planners really trying to dial in that thermometer, you know, the economy thinking uh, arrogantly that they can. I think that really destroys a lot of the supply, not just of housing, but in goods of goods and services across the board. And I think that might be a driver of higher prices, even to a greater extent than the increase of the actual money supply by the Fed handing out stimmies or the government handing out UBI. Um, They definitely both play into it. But, uh, you know, as an example, in 2019, my portfolio was, you know, it was doing all right. I had made some money. I, I did well in real estate. But in 2021, my personal portfolio is a lot larger than it was. It's grown significantly since Why? 2019 because of ask, because asset prices have gone up so oh, okay. much. Okay, yeah. You see? But my point is right now, and you guys, I'm sure, are experiencing this. Is my life better now or in 2019 as far as if it's measured by the amount of goods and services I have access to? Exactly. Right? I mean, I'm in Florida, which is very open, but it's almost impossible to get a reservation at a, a restaurant on a Friday evening, you know, two or three hour wait. It's almost impossible to get an Uber, uh, to get a taxi. I mean, you just can't, there, there's so many. I went to the grocery store the other day to get a toothbrush and they were completely sold out of toothbrushes. There's just none available. I mean, can you imagine going back to 2019 and going to your local grocery store and then not having any toothbrushes? I mean, what is going on here? Socialism, so this see, is called socialism. Yeah, but it, exactly. It, it reminds you of what true wealth is. We get brainwashed as a society to believe that wealth is just this little piece of paper, like a green piece of paper here in the United States called a dollar. Yeah. Or wealth is determined by a, a number. 
that's in your checking account, right? But, but let's think about what that number represents for a moment. You see, that number isn't, it's not like they have that many green pieces of paper just sitting in a vault with your name on it. No, that number is basically just a bank liability. It's, an, it's them saying we owe you this many fiat units, which yeah. by the way is another IOU. So it's like saying we owe you IOUs, right? So if you think, which most of society does, that society is wealthier if the number on aggregate total of their checking account goes up, well then what you're saying is that you believe society is wealthier if we just increase the amount of liabilities in the commercial banking system. Well, that doesn't make a lot of sense, right? And taking it to another extreme, you say, okay, well, if you were stranded on a deserted island and you had a chest full of a billion dollars or a billion euro, well, would you be rich or poor? Well, you'd be dirt poor because the only thing around you is a coconut. And so you can't, you can't, you don't have any stuff. There's no goods and services. So that's really how we need to uh, determine and see wealth. You know, I'm on Twitter occasionally, and I see a lot of these guys that on paper have made a fortune in Bitcoin or cryptocurrency or just fill in the blank, you know, gold, you name it, uh, any asset. In stocks, price. yeah, real estate. Yeah, or they're, and they're saying how, you know, Bitcoin is going to go to a million dollars, which it, it very well may go to a million dollars and how they're going to be rich. They're going to be fabulously rich. Um, maybe, but you see what they're forgetting is in a world where Bitcoin is a million dollars a Bitcoin, what, what will your access to goods and services be, right? And if, you, if, if we live in a world where there are very few goods and services, it doesn't matter how much gold you own, it doesn't matter how much real estate you own. It doesn't matter how much crypto you own. You're going to be poor. Your quality of life, your standard of living is going to go down. I mean, an easy thought experiment would be just imagine if you lived in Venezuela right now, right? You live in Venezuela and, and you can't get out. And you know that you go to the local grocery store and there's basically nothing there. There's no medicine if you get sick. So you could be a, a, a Bitcoin billionaire. And if, if the whole world was Venezuela, you wouldn't be that rich, would you? So you see, my point is, as a society, we really need to start focusing on producing goods and services efficiently. So how does this help people see the policies of the World Economic Forum or the central planners in a more clear light? Okay, so I know a lot of people get um, kind of tied up with thinking through universal basic income, right? Or these STEMI checks. Say, George, well, how can this possibly be bad? It's helping people that need the help right now. It's putting money in their back pocket so they can go out and spend it. And that, you know, one man's spending is another man's income, this type of belief system. Well, I would just simply ask you to look at things through the lens of what true wealth is, the way we just explained it. So, are these STEMI checks in the future, will they produce, will they create an environment where society is producing more goods and services or fewer goods and services? Now think about that. The government is paying people to stay home. The government is paying people to not produce. Think of the distortions that is creating and the obvious answer is over the long run, especially if this continues, they're creating an economic environment that produces fewer goods and services. Therefore, by definition, uh, through these stimulus checks and UBI, they would, they would make society poorer in aggregate total. And I think if there's one thing people can take away from the conversation, if they can just take away that concept, it'll help them see the world through a much clearer lens and understand, you know, how to set up their portfolio to try to somehow increase their purchasing power. Uh, but then also, you know, puts the priority on going to a place where you're actually going to have most likely 
going to have uh, access to the most amount of goods and services possible. And I don't know if that's the United States. I don't know if that's a develop, the, the developed world in the next 15 years, in the next 20 years. That's a big question mark. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, so I, I'm expecting, for example, more taxes as well in the Western world everywhere, yeah. because somehow they have to finance the debts. Um, do you expect taxes on real estate as well? Yeah, I mean, a lot of states, uh, most notably California, yeah. have even discussed having an unrealized capital gains tax. So let's just say you buy a house for a hundred thousand dollars, <laughs> and you know, next thing you know, Zillow or the local MLS, you know, they do comps and they say that your house is worth a million now, but you don't even sell, but you're you have to pay taxes on the $900,000 gain that Zillow tells you you have. Uh, now, they, that's not law yet, but they've discussed doing things like that. Yeah. They've discussed a wealth tax, obviously, and that would really play into uh, real estate owners. And you know what's, I think what people need to think through with the, these wealth taxes, whenever they're proposed, at least from what I've seen, they very rarely have a clause for inflation. Yeah. So if they say that, okay, well, this wealth tax is only going to affect people that have a net worth of 5 million euro. Okay, well, what if we get even 1970s in the US type inflation, let's say 10, 12, 15% per annum. Yeah. Okay? Well, that million dollar home you own right now, or even a $500,000 or 500,000 euro home, It, hey, in 10 years, that thing could be easily worth $5 million, but you haven't increased your purchasing power at all. The, the, the house can, if you sell the house in the, the next 10 years, let's say if it's worth 5 million euro, if it just goes up at the rate of inflation, you can't buy any more goods and services than you can buy by selling the house right now, or maybe even when you bought it. So that's what you've got to pay attention to. But on the same token, Although you, you didn't increase your purchasing power, you get caught up in this tax net just because of the rate of inflation. And obviously that happens a lot and uh, with the tax brackets and the income tax as well. But I think they're going to have to raise property taxes slightly or significantly the, depending on the state. And that's going to affect homeowners. I think across the board, they're going to be increasing taxes, even if they don't uh, have to philosophically, I think they're going to just because they get political brownie points by soaking the rich, right? And what I, what I meant by that statement <clears throat> is a lot of these people or politicians on the left have adopted this policy of MMT. Yeah. Okay, well, if you believe in MMT, then why are we increasing taxes? Yeah. Exactly. But do we pay taxes anyhow if we can just exactly. it out of thin air? You know, they can exactly. pay taxes it, themselves. It, yeah. Yeah. Right. Well, they would argue the only re reason you pay taxes is because it gives them a lever to control inflation. But if, if we have all of this excess capacity in the system, which is what the Keynesians and the MMTers would argue, then why don't we just drop the whole tax thing right now yeah. Yeah. until a point in which you see significant inflation, then you go ahead and bring the taxes back in to take dollars out of the system and to cap that inflation once the economy is quote unquote overheating, you know, by their definition. But you see, it's the same politicians that try to uh, push MMT are the same ones that say that we need to increase taxes. So just by hearing them say those two, uh, those two are uh, just to hear them talk about those two ideas tells you everything you need to know about their ethics, their morals, and their principles. And what I mean by that is they're saying two different things, which makes it obvious that they have no principles, they have no morals, and they have no ethics. They're just telling you what they think you need to hear in order to get your vote. Yeah, they lie. 
Yeah, it's all a Ponzi scheme, everything, the monetary system, the political system, it's all a Ponzi. So let's talk about the central banks, because um, you've been a wizard on central bank policies and then explaining um, how the whole thing, the whole, whole game works, actually. So where does it all lead? What is the end game of the, of the central banks? What do you think? Well, I think the end game is, you know, there's an end game for the central banks, but I also think there's another end game in mind for the people at the World Economic Forum and the IMF. And I think if uh, we talked about the central banks game plan, they want to control the currency yeah. and using the Federal Reserve as an example, uh, they know that they don't control the dollar. They know that that's the commercial banking system yeah. and they're held hostage by the commercial banking system or the politicians, like we were discussing earlier, fiscal policy. And so they're gonna to wanna to take that back and that takes you to a central bank digital currency. But if you look at the IMF and the World Economic Forum, what they've been talking about is not, is yes, the local countries would have their own digital currency, but what, what would be even greater, the bigger umbrella would be the digital SDR which is a special drawing right. Yeah. So they see that as the main reserve asset, if you will, for the central banks, which would give them control and power. So I think there's two different dynamics okay. at play there when, when we're talking about the end game. But if we take a macro view with the global elite, I think their end game is really a socialist utopia. And I, let's just for a moment, give them the benefit of the doubt and say that they're, they have good intentions. And I know that's debatable, but let's just say that they do. And they truly believe that the way to move society forward is to have a more centrally planned global economy. Let's just say that, that that's, that's what they believe. Well, if you're one of those people, you have to go back and look at history and say, okay, well, we've tried this in the past. Why didn't it work? Okay, so you go back to Marx and, uh, you know, Marx was, uh, he wasn't that much of an enemy of capitalism. He actually said that to go from feudalism, uh, the next step, it has to be capitalism. And then you go to socialism. If you go to socialism too quick, you're going to run into problems. Yeah. You've got to leverage the benefits of capitalism. So when they look at the, the story of what happened in Russia, communist Russia, they come to the conclusion that they just tried capitalism too soon. That's number one. Number two, or excuse me, they tried socialism and communism too soon. They didn't let capitalism do its job. Number two is they understand that it's almost impossible to allocate resources efficiently if you have no price signals. Yeah. You see, uh, if, if there are no prices coming into individual entrepreneurs or people that are in control of the means of production, then you don't know where that steel should go. You don't know where that lumber should go. And that's why you see a country like the Ukraine and Russia, you know, they can have a massive famine, although they should have plenty of food for not only their own country, but to export to all of Europe and maybe the, the entire world. So uh, they understand this. So if you think about moving forward to a centrally planned economy, they know that one of the hurdles they're going to have to get over. One of the problems they're going to have to solve is this lack of price discovery that, and price signals that the free market is so good at producing. Okay, well, let's go back and think about that world of central bank digital currency where we all have an account, a business account, and to, you know, corporations, it doesn't matter. We're all banking with the central bank. Well, that would mean that all of the transactions that are occurring daily in the economy are going to a database, a centralized database in real time. Yeah. That's very powerful, yeah. especially if you're able to combine artificial intelligence and layer that over the database. So you have all this data coming in from literally billions of transactions happening on a daily basis going into a database. And then those numbers are being crunched by this artificial intelligence. And then the artificial intelligence is able to tell the central planners how to allocate those resources, just like price signals do yeah. in a free market economy. So, and this is all 
speculation. You know, I, I they, I'm coming to these conclusions a few different ways. Number one, reading everything that they say on the topic on their own website. So this is coming straight to them, reading what their vision is for the world by 2030. I'm sure you've done uh, videos on that, that uh, you'll own nothing and, and you'll be happy type of, of, of deal. And then also just trying to put myself in their shoes and saying, listen, if you had to solve the problem and, 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 and if a free market capitalist society was not an option, that was not an option at all. And you had to solve this problem, you know, how would you do it? And I think that that's what makes the most sense to me is this leverage artificial intelligence, but you'd have to have the data to do that. And I think that's why another reason why this, the, you're going to see a big push toward the central bank digital currency, um, you know, above and beyond just the ability to uh, micromanage inflation by producing, uh, you know, negative interest rates uh, and banning cash which is kind of the more obvious uh, thing that comes to mind. So George, do you think they will succeed in implementing this dystopian future? I think it's a 50-50 shot, <laughs> okay. really. Um, okay. I, you know, obviously I, I hope not because this takes us down a very, very bad You know, it's the, the, the road to serfdom. It takes us to totalitarianism. And uh, we've seen how that plays out in the past, and that doesn't work well. Um, but this is not a foregone conclusion. Yeah. One thing that I found very uh, enlightening and inspiring from this uh, version of Road to Serfdom that I have, this audio book where it, it's got a lot of notes from, uh, from Hayek himself, is that after World War II, he felt there was going to be a big push towards central planning for the reason, like in the United States, that, okay, well, my gosh, look at what we just did over World War II. And we had, uh, you know, the government control the means of production. We had the government controlling everything. And that seemed to work pretty well. So if it worked well, Uh, during World War II, then maybe, you know, why wouldn't it work well in the economy after we're done with the war? And UK had a, a similar kind of mindset there with society. And you had a big push towards that. And then obviously, you know, <clears throat> excuse me, what was going on in, in, in Russia at the time. So he used this as an example to show that in all three countries, you had the same type of uh, narrative that was being pushed, but they went in completely different directions. The UK kind of went down the middle. Russia went toward the, the central planning and the United States kind of said, well, yeah, maybe it's a good idea, but yeah, maybe not. Let's kind of more go toward this free market side. So just because you're on the road to serfdom doesn't mean that you can't get off. So that's, and I, didn't really realize that. I, I, I thought that once you're going down this slippery slope, that it's, it's inevitable that you come to this end game that we're talking about, but it's not. Um, it, it, if, if we all ignore what's going on around us, if we don't educate ourselves, then yes, that we're, that's the probability is very close to 100% that eventually, whether it's in 10 years, 20 years, that that's what the world looks like, especially in the developed world. Mm -hmm. But thanks to podcasts like yours and YouTube channels like yours, more and more people are, are waking up to what's going on in yeah. the world around them. Mm -hmm. And I can tell you that just in my little part of the world here and on the West Coast of Florida, a lot of people just aren't putting up with it. And they're just saying, listen, I, I don't want any more of this. I don't like big government. And, you know, they, what's difficult on social media is you have this vocal minority that's very pro-socialist. Yeah. But when you go around and actually talk to real, real people, people no very one. few people, uh, you know, fall into that. They just don't realize that the stimmy checks and the UBI 
put us on the road to social, like they don't connect the dots. Yeah. So fortunately with guys like you out there on YouTube, connecting the dots for everyone, hopefully that will wake up enough people and create this awareness to where we can get off the slippery slope that we're on right now. Yeah. That's why your job, your channel is just priceless because you help to educate the people as well. Um, Janet Chen said something interesting recently. She said um, the central banks might need to raise interest rates to prevent the econom economy to um, overheat. Um, could, it be, could, it, could it be possible that they do something like that one um, um, for one last crash before implementing the CBDCs to bail everyone out and suck into the system? What do you think? Is this a possibility? For sure. Yeah, I, I think that you've got to compartmentalize inflation and deflation. Yeah. So many people just see it as this monolith, that it's just this one big rock that just kind of moves together, right? It's not. Look at the currency relative to other currencies. The, the DXY here in the United States would be the the measurement of the dollar against a basket of other currencies, uh, most specifically the euro. I think 57% is the, the euro as far as that basket of other currencies. You have to look at the price of goods and services that you're buying daily. And then you have to look at asset prices. And so those can all move in different directions. So by definition, if asset prices are going down, the dollar against those asset prices is going up. Right, we're getting asset price yep. deflation. Uh, or if the dollar is going down on the DXY, then the dollar is depreciating uh, against those other currencies. Right, if you've got the price of goods and services going up against the dollar, then you're seeing consumer price inflation. The value of that dollar is going down. So all these things can happen at the same time. A good example I like to give is the United States in the early 1970s. We know that that was our decade of uh, significant inflation, but the stock market went down from 72 to 74 by over 50%. So just because you have uh, consumer prices going up doesn't mean that asset prices won't come down in nominal terms. And that's why another reason why people need to be so careful about how they invest right now, because we are in the everything bubble. Yeah, I mean, that, that is just the bottom line, especially here in the United States. I and mean, when you look at real estate, it's the everything bubble. When you look at the stock market, everything bubble. Bonds, obviously, you know, at 5,000 year lows, which means that the interest rates are at 5,000 year lows, the bond prices are at 5,000 year highs. And it's the same thing with corporate debt. And it's, it doesn't mean that there's not opportunities out there. But every single person that's got money to work, that's trying to preserve their purchasing power from being eroded or protect their purchasing power, the, the value of what they have from being eroded by inflation, they, they need to be cognizant of these things. And again, it goes back to why uh, your channel and others are, are so important. Yeah. Yeah, let's talk about investment. You you said um, you mentioned in several videos that your investment portfolio looks like 80-10-10, 10% in gold and precious metals, 80% yeah. in investments that serve you as a passive income like real estate or yeah. um, dividend stocks and 10% in uh, potential moonshots like Bitcoin. So yeah. um, you you have been quite skeptical um, about Bitcoin, but it seems like you're warming up, warming up for, for Bitcoin. So what are your current thoughts on Bitcoin and what's What do you think for the future will hold up for Bitcoin? Well, I don't know if skeptical is the right word. I've been bullish on Bitcoin for quite some time and I've owned Bitcoin for uh, you know, several years. I think the, the Bitcoin debate, you need to also compartmentalize and yeah. uh, say a lot of people conflate the two, that meaning that there's an argument as to how high the price of Bitcoin may go. Will it go to 500,000? Will it go to a million? And then there's also the argument, will Bitcoin become global money? Mm -hmm. will, will it take out all the, the, the fiat currencies? Will it replace the, the dollar as the world reserve currency or a, a global digital reserve yeah. asset? You know, And I think those are two completely separate questions. Sure. Yeah. And they're two different uh, groupings of, of probabilities. 
And most people just conflate the two. They, they, they seem to think that if you believe the price of Bitcoin is going up, then you must believe that Bitcoin is going to dethrone the dollar. Yeah. You know, and I, I think that those are, are exclusive ideas. Uh, so, um, you know, if you have to give me the, the probabilities of Bitcoin going to $100,000 as mm-hmm. an example, well, I think the probabilities are, are, are pretty good. Yeah. Now, what is the probability that Bitcoin replaces the dollar as the global reserve currency and the whole entire world is using Bitcoin from a standpoint of transactions? Um, I think the probabilities are pretty low. Mm-hmm. So uh, that's just what I, I try to, and even if it did, and what I've tried to communicate, probably not very well through social media and some of my videos, is I don't know that if Bitcoin does succeed and become global money, we might not, we might be in the exact same position we're in now, just in 20 years and 30 years. And one of the things that I've said over and over again is if you have perfect money that's controlled by imperfect human beings in an imperfect world, the perfect money is still going to behave imperfectly. Yeah. And what I mean by that is if you go back and look at the history of banking, uh, and I don't know it in other countries as well as I know it in the United States, but you go from a full reserve system to a fractional reserve system that we had in the early 1800s, but that fractional reserve system was controlled exclusively by the commercial banks. So we had something called free banking, which meant that it was free of government intervention and it was free of a central bank. And then you, so that was not something that was produced by the government. That was a a product of the free market, just fulfilling a need. And so if you look at how the system worked back then with gold as the reserve asset, and then how that played out, and then how we nationalized the the banks because of the Civil War in the United States. And then we had the central bank come in in 1913. And then if you just replace the reserve asset, uh, or if you replace gold with Bitcoin as the reserve asset, you know, does, does it not play out in a similar way, which over the span of decades gets us to a problem, the same problem that we have today, because they can take a a certain amount of base money, call it Bitcoin, and they can create loans, uh, additional, let's say, IOUs for Bitcoins, the, the exact same way that they did with gold. Now, the counter argument to that, which is very good, by the way, is that, well, we probably, we might not go down that path because Bitcoin is decentralized and you don't need to to store it with a bank. And if you're not having to store it with a central entity, then they don't have the control over creating this fractional reserve system. It would be in the power and in the hands of the people. And I totally get that. And it's a, a very valid point. But I still think that those average Joes and Janes that are saving in Bitcoin and transacting in Bitcoin uh, if, if they have significant savings, they're going to come to a point where they're like, listen, I want to earn an interest rate on my Bitcoin and I don't have time to do that myself. Yeah. So I'm going to give it to that, that guy here on the corner because he's really good at, uh, at getting a return and everyone's going to do that or not everyone, but a lot of people are going to do that. Give it to that guy on the corner that's really good at getting a return. And then that guy in the corner is going to say, well, shoot, I need an office that looks nice and secure. Don't we have a bank? <laughs> so <laughs> that's just, it, it's kind of a thought experiment, but I don't know that a lot of uh, uh, Bitcoiners have, have thought that one through. And that's just, and when I'm tweeting stuff like that, often it's not because I'm anti-Bitcoin. I'm not. I mean, philosophically, I, I sure do hope that Bitcoin succeeds. I'm just trying to think through probabilities. And what I do is I just throw out things to hopefully uh, encourage people to think and, and, and think in terms of probabilities and not in certainties. Yeah. Because that's the big mistake that I see people, not only in the Bitcoin space, but the everywhere. gold space everywhere. We they think in terms of certainties. 
And I think that's just a, a, a path to financial disaster. Yeah, nothing is certain, especially not in this historic times, you know. <laughs> so yeah. to, to wrap it up, um, what is your outlook for the next 12, 24, 36 months? And will you adjust your portfolio? Will you change something on your 80, 10, 10 portfolio? Well, I, I'm a very long-term investor. Okay. I, I don't really sell anything. In fact, of all the stocks that I've purchased since 2012, um, if my memory serves me, I don't know that I've sold any of them. Okay. And so I, I don't go you know, in and out. I don't know what's going to happen in, in 12 months and uh, okay. 36 months. What I try to do is just buy things when they're cheap and sell them when they're expensive. And I, I, I don't try to worry about the price direction. Okay. I'm, I'm not smart enough to know where the price of oil is going. And let's use that as an example, because that's easy for everyone to understand. When you look at a chart of oil long term adjusted for inflation, you see that when it gets below $30 a barrel, it, it, it's pretty darn cheap. It's going to revert to a mean there yeah. you know, with a certain amount of time. And you would have done well by buying under, if you, had, if you were a long-term investor, you would have done well by buying it under 30. Usually you do well, uh, you're not going to hit every top or sell at the top, but you'd be do, doing well if you start selling around $80 a barrel. Okay. You see, so it, like when oil tanked in March of 2020, I remember it was right around $20 a barrel. So under my 30 kind of threshold, my $30 threshold that would tell me that it's, that it's quote unquote cheap historically. Um, I thought oil was going lower. Yeah. I thought it was going down to $10 a barrel, but I went and bought a ton of oil producers at 20, just because I'm not trying to answer the question of where the price is going. I'm yeah. only trying to answer the question, is it cheap? Yeah. And if it's cheap, I buy it. Right. So uh, I don't know what I'll be doing with my portfolio, but I can tell you that as far as the oil producers that I own, if we get oil going above $80 a barrel, although I might think it's going to 100 or 150, I'll still start selling because, uh, it, you know, I'm, I'm someone who learned uh, this goes way back in, in my past, but I kind of uh, got into blackjack. So I'm always, you know, as in the early 2000s, I was counting cards and that's really what shapes my investment philosophy is, is, is the game of blackjack. And in the game of blackjack, uh, you've got an edge if you're playing correctly by basic strategy and you're counting cards. And uh, as long as you play by the rules and you do that over and over and over again, you have the law of large numbers on your side mathematically you're going to come out ahead. Now, it doesn't mean that you're not going to lose hands, but you, as long as you play by the rules, then you're going to come out ahead over the long run. And I look at investing the same way. So my rule with oil, you know, is just buy it under 30, sell it under 80. So uh, as I'm, I'm, going to, I'm going to do that, even though I think the price might be going higher, yeah. just because I know that if I stick to my rules, my investment rules, just like blackjack over the long run, uh, my portfolio should be higher in the future than it is today. Marvelous. George, great. Definitely great talk, great conversation. So where can people find more about you? Oh, they can just Google George Gammon, G-A-M-M-O-N, all the YouTube stuff. That, that's the name of my YouTube channel. They'll find the Twitter and uh, my website. Yeah, I will put all the links in the show notes, definitely. And I'm really looking forward to talk to you again soon, I hope, because it's, it's just mind-blowing picking your brain. It was a delight for me and a pleasure. And yeah, thank you very much. And one last question I have, actually. What do you think? What's the meaning of life? Sorry, just came up my mind. <laughs> what's the meaning of life? Because you talked about money, investing, central banks, but this is a totally different question. So what's the meaning of life for George Gammon? Is it traveling or what is it? Oh, the meaning of life for George Gammon. Well, obviously your family is your, your first priority. Okay. Uh, I think that's awesome. kind of why we're all here, you know. Um, but as far as me personally... I think it's just about, uh, you know, it's about setting objectives and, 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 and challenges for yourself to get outside of your comfort zone so you can grow uh, not only professionally, but grow personally as well. 
And I don't think any of us are, or, or maybe I should say it this way. I think we learn the most and we achieve the most and we grow the most when we're outside of our comfort zone, trying to tackle things that challenge us today. So if I can continue to try to um, overcome challenges and to uh, improve myself uh, daily from a personal standpoint and a professional standpoint, uh, then I know that at the end of the day, I'll have uh, lived life to its fullest. And yeah. that's kind of how I define uh, a life well lived. Beautiful, beautiful. Please take us with you uh, on your journey, take us with us to your journey um, and share your thoughts and um, yeah, share your wisdom definitely with us because it's just um, great for getting more aware and um, see be beneath the horizon. Um, thank you for your time. It was definitely a very exciting and very interesting. Um, I'm still honored and I'm looking forward to talking to you again. Thank you, George, for your time. Thank you for having me.